And I'm Terry Cook. You're watching Hamilton's Vital Signs, uh, broadcasting in living color from my den with my trusty golden retriever at my feet, Scouty, world's best golden retriever. Um, this month, it's my pleasure to welcome an old friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Richardson, the Medical Officer of Health in Hamilton and somebody with whom I've spent a lot of time over many, many years. Elizabeth, good to have you with us. Thanks, Terry. It's good to be with you here. Um, I, I want to start, we're going to talk obviously about pandemic and, and what you're challenged with. And I'm, I'm really appreciating the fact that you're finding the time in what uh, really are extraordinary times for the community and for you. Uh, but I always like to start with a bit of bio. So tell us a little bit about who you are, how you came to do the work that you're doing, born and raised where, where'd you go to school, and how come you ended up doing public health. Tell us a bit about that. The whole nine yards. So I'm actually from Northern Ontario. I'm from Cochrane and Timmins is where I grew up. I'm the daughter of uh, two Brits that came over to Canada uh, when the National Health Service first started in Britain. And uh, my dad actually went to train in the U.S. as well and uh, then ended up coming to Saskatchewan just in the Tommy Douglas days. And uh, he was at, yeah, working as a general surgeon there and then uh, moved over to Cochrane where I was born and, uh, and Timmins. And that's where I got to spend some time with him a little bit at the hospital then and kind of liked uh, healthcare and the things that were there. My mother was, had been a nurse. She was actually in that, that age where as a woman, um, going back to school once married, because she was a British trained nurse, uh, going back to school once married was very frowned upon. Mm -hmm. And so she actually went ahead and had a college diploma instead and, uh, and became a business administrator within the Robarts Research Institute in London, in Ontario, when she moved down there, when we were at school there, my, I was there and my sister had moved back to London as well. So there's a, a long history of sort of healthcare related things. And so no surprise, I ended up in medicine and was deciding what I wanted to do. And it first started out with actually pediatrics because the whole mm -hmm. piece of wanting to for people to get off to a good start. And um, so spent two years at Sick Kids, and it was looking I was going like I was going to be in southern Ontario for the remainder of, of my foreseeable for future. And pediatrics in Toronto is very subspecialized. You know, general pediatrics is a very small, you know, except a very small. Uh, sort of portion of peds with you know lots of very highly specialized docs who are absolutely needed but it wasn't what I wanted to do so I started looking around and was fortunate to meet Bob Nozel who was then the mm -hmm. medical officer for Halton, Halton. Yep. and uh, and Monica Naus who's a physician working with the province and they let me do two electives as we call them did two months with them and I loved it and the things about prevention and um, you know the communicable disease control pieces like we're dealing with right now, the epidemiology, um, all the person, place, and time things, the kind of investigative work of public health I really enjoyed. Um, so decided to make the switch, and so switched over when I was doing my uh, training program, and then actually came to Hamilton as my first job as an associate medical officer. And where, where was I bet that? you, 1995. Yep. Wow. Yeah, 25 oh, years ago this summer. Go for both of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so started off as the first day associate and then became full-time medical officer in 1998. And wow. I've been here all the way through. That's amazing. Um, and where, where'd you study? Where'd you go to so, undergrad and, and where'd you go to study medicine? So both undergrad and medicine at uh, Western and then came to Toronto with uh, going to sick kids. And then as part of a, a public health preventive medicine program, you do a master's as well. So I did my graduate work at uh, University of Toronto. There you go. Go Mustangs. Another thing yeah. we have in common. How yeah, about that? Purple and white. Let's go. <laughs> um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, where, by the way, our old friend Chris Mackey is now presiding mm -hmm. and doing great work uh, in public health. Your former uh, understudy um, and my former squash partner. Um, right. Um, t I know that in the municipal world, you essentially uh, game out uh, emergency response and, and you go through scenario planning and prepare for all kinds of eventualities. You've been through a couple of extraordinary experiences in terms of dealing with large scale public health challenges. Tell me a little bit about that experience, what you may have anticipated that would have prepared this community for what you're going through now, and, and what's different about this experience? 
Mm, yeah, I've done, you know, with Hamilton being the size it is, it tends to have a few more real events too that help to keep us well trained. So my mm -hmm. first one was probably Plastimet uh, mm -hmm. when I was a new grad and, um, you know, the there was lots to do with that one from an environmental perspective, but also from the standpoint of, of learning about recovery and the fact that, you know, a lot of people spend a lot of time focusing on the emergency itself and the things that are happening there. Um, but then there's the piece about how do you move forward from that? So everything from um, the North End, how do they recover their gardens and be able to mm -hmm. grow their vegetable gardens again? Um, and use the, the produce that was within them to, you know, the, the firefighters who had mm -hmm. gone through that experience and the home, you know, some of the homeowners who had been there um, and trying to understand what the health implications were from a longer term perspective. And then the site and other things you find when you test. Whenever we do a whole bunch of tests, you find out even more mm -hmm. than is it related to the specific issue. And so recovery just was so important. It, and it's often one of the things from an emergency perspective that isn't well done. Um, so that really underscored the importance of that. You know, my next big one, um, and certainly we had other smaller ones, you know, mm -hmm. ice storms and, and yep. those sorts of things. But, and we generally would average about one, an emergency every one to two years in Hamilton when I first started out. And not so much the last decade, I would say. But uh, SARS, of course, was the big one mm -hmm. from a public health perspective. And just, you know, a lot of, of issues of dealing with the unknown what do you do when you don't understand a lot about a disease and its epidemiology, the person, place, and time piece mm -hmm. about how it spreads, who's likely to affect, who gets really sick with it. And so we spent, um, you know, a lot of time dealing with that one. The, what was interesting about that one was we were able to get into a routine mm -hmm. uh, fairly easily. And we really just developed the sort of cadre um, of Hamilton health sector um, leaders for the hospitals at Hampton Health Sciences, St. Mm -hmm. Joe's, within primary care, from the long-term care hospitals, bringing in the infection control practitioners and experts. We really developed that Hamilton team mm -hmm. uh, during, during SARS and, um, you know, learned how to take the direction that was coming from the province and, and figure out how best to, to Im implement that here in Hamilton. And yeah, it just really showed the expertise that is present here. You know, mm -hmm. we're lucky enough to be what we call a tertiary healthcare center. Yeah. And um, so we have a lot of experts and a lot of, of abilities here and can really shine when we utilize those together. Um, H1N1 then was one where we went into, this was the, mm -hmm. the flu that started off down in uh, Mexico sort of area. We saw it in the spring and had a bit of a response there, but didn't really see it in full force here um, until the fall. And so that was a longer emergency. It felt longer than SARS if it wasn't actually in fact, and, um, but not quite as severe as this one is. And this was the first one where we had, you know, we, we just started to understand provincial direction around healthcare, I would say during SARS. Mm -hmm. And then it got stronger with H1N1, which is good. The cent we need a strong central agency or ministry or combination of all those things to lead. And those were being developed in the post SARS learnings. Yeah, there was massive learnings coming out of SARS, of course. Yeah. And, uh, and then into H1N1. So a lot of those got applied. But again, that made in Hamilton, ha what does that mean for us? You know, mm -hmm. we have a lot of expertise to understand, to feedback up to, to make sure that um, we're developing the best possible solutions we can. And so double down on that team, took us to a new structure. We had Dave McCann with us then. Mm -hmm. uh, which was fantastic. He was an eMERGE doc, or uh, sorry, a primary care physician who'd done a lot of emergency response in the U.S. And so he was instrumental at bringing us to a new level of, of performing. And that's when we opened our first assessment center, which is a joint mm -hmm. initiative between primary care and the hospitals and public health. And, and so we learned a lot with that one. And, um, and then here we are now with COVID, you know, lots of other tests and planning exercise and that sort of thing but this one's bigger than any of them oh yeah as you can well imagine and and with additional community and political dimensions that i'm not sure any of us have ever lived through or experienced so take me back to when this first landed on the radar screen of of your public health team some of the early deliberations the bringing together of the eoc and then as you started to have to respond kind of on a community basis. So just walk us through some of those early steps. 
Absolutely. So those those first days, of course, were when we started to hear about it in China and understand, you know, what was going on and and the intelligence. I remember back dealing with SARS and and people talking about how they were watching CNN sometimes or during Ebola uh, outbreaks, they were watching CNN to get updates Mm -hmm. because sometimes the media was there and on the ground faster than the healthcare system could communicate information via its channels. Um, And so, you know, now we have much better channels for information to flow and flow through WHO, as well as flowing through media and and other things. They still play a very strong role in getting information out. Um, But really getting that information, you know, pretty, having gone through SARS and H1N1, pretty well prepared for, you know, not just kind of wondering if it would come or, or setting it aside and thinking it was somebody else's problem, but pretty clear that this was going to be a problem we were all going to, to be dealing with in time to start preparing. And so you do start doing those things. You start drawing together the team, who's going to do this, the, the intelligence, as we call it, of the information starts circulating. Um, and just, you know, the, the debate around what are the appropriate measures when it's a brand new virus. It's something mm-hmm. new. We don't know anything about it. Um, and we're watching somewhere far, far away deal with it. And, uh, you know, you're not going to get all the all the, the details. So, you know, we, we started to bring together the public health group. Whenever you're dealing with an emergency, the way it works is you have the initial responding group you know whoever it is is that business to do so we have an infectious disease team whose business it is to do infectious disease control and you just keep mounting up the response depending on where we're at so we start with the id team then we move to it being you know a partial activation within public health services then we move to a full activation within public health services of an emergency response so that means bringing together a very structured group of people with very clear roles and responsibilities to manage the uh, the issue you know and there we're we're communicating with you know council with the um the city manager, and then we elevate that to say, okay, this is getting bigger. We need to go to an EOC, a citywide EOC. And so that's when Paul's group got pulled together. Same thing, very structured response Mm -hmm. system. And so we have those two groups working together um, from a city perspective on this particular issue. And when you started to activate in terms of directing that certain services, businesses, other things had to, to adjust and change, and in some cases close, um, I'm curious about who you were looking to, either on a national or international stage, for guidance. Were there places that, in particular, uh, you thought were getting it right and that provided some insight who were a little earlier in the curve than we were? And, and how, did, how did that play out that debate about, you know, what are the right guideposts that that will give us the information we may need to make decisions that are good for Hamilton? Well, that's where, you know, looking at a whole different group of sort of inputs is very important. So in those early days, you're looking to the WHO, to World Health Organization, because they have the, the best ability to get in, get information and distribute it and start to develop guidelines. Uh, at the same time, at the national level, Public Health Agency of Canada is doing that work as well and starting to understand what that means for Canada. What does that mean for Canadians? Where should Canadians sit in this? What does the evidence say about levers they have in their hands? So border closures, restricting mm-hmm. travel, those sorts of issues in particular. And then you are looking at the provincial level as well because they look more at the things that are relevant on a local basis, hospitals, primary care, what's going to happen there. And for us within public health, what are the how are we going to apply public health measures? And we knew, given that there wasn't a lot of of understanding about this virus and that we didn't have a vaccine, we didn't have treatment for it, then it's what we call public health measures that become the critical things that that help to do control. So things like physical distancing, good hygiene, you know, all those Mm -hmm. closing down businesses, those all become the core of it. And so that discussion and debate about how they work. And then you start to have the cultural issues Um, about what's acceptable where. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, you saw some of the stories coming out of China about the extent to which they would go um, to make sure people were isolated. At the same time, you saw that they could build a hospital in Mm -hmm. short order in two weeks, Um, you know, and and trying to parse out knowing different areas of the world and just how transparent they are or not, trying to understand information in that context. And so, 
why are they building another hospital? It must be pretty bad, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, for them to do that. Or what is the approach that they're trying to take? So we, we, ha we always take from multiple sources. We, of course, turn to those levels of government who give us direction around policy. Um, but there's always collaboration across the country where public health is not a big field. And mm -hmm. so collaboration across the country is always big. Um, but we always look outside too. We're always looking at the scientific research. We're looking at other people who are publishing papers and ideas and using them both to inform our own approach to enrich it, but also to ask questions about, about what the decisions are. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you a little bit about social determinants because you and I have spent a lot of time in the last couple of years bringing together the healthcare sector and really the social sector, uh, affordable housing, people are working on food security and other issues. And, and what's clear again from this pandemic, and I know we're midstream, so there's lots of things we don't know, is that it's not landing proportionately or equally on all demographics. And and we obviously know that that seniors living in congregate care are, are more, more vulnerable. And I'm pretty sure we'll have inquiries about that once this is all over. Yeah. But we also know, especially when you look at the US, that it's breaking down differently based on income and race and other things. So I just, I'd ask you to reflect upon what we're paying attention to and what we, we may learn about this that will feed into that work about how do we intervene early to get better health outcomes for, for everybody. Yeah, the social determinants play in to every disease that we work with in every situation. And, you know, just as we see around other chronic diseases that people who are doing more poorly on things like income or employment or housing have a harder time, uh, we're going to see, we have seen already, and we're going to continue to see that with this disease, that that all of those factors are more important important ultimately than healthcare in terms of determining how uh, any particular individual does. Um, so it is going to be a challenge to stay balanced in approach around this disease. You know, it's challenging as you and I have experienced in having those conversations when we have a pretty good handle on mm -hmm. things and, and how they work, right? To remember what it is that influences health the most. Yeah. Um, it's even more of a challenge when you're dealing with something that you're uncertain about. And when you're trying to get that, um, you know, under control and, and, you know, uncertainty, fear are more of a, of a, of a factor than ever. And so, you know, we need to continue to think about our response to this virus and try to balance that as much as possible. Try to have a group that is stepping back, is looking at the big picture, that is saying, okay, here's what we're doing in relation to controlling this virus, and we absolutely need a strong control program. But here is the way that it's affecting some people more than others. And so what do we need to do? I love that analogy about the three stools, mm -hmm. you know, and how do we make it so that we're all, you know, getting access to the things we need um, and so how are we doing that? And so we actually do within our actual, we call it an IAP, an instant action plan. The last thing we turn to at every meeting is, you know, when we're thinking about vulnerable populations, what more do we need to think about? Um, you know, we've taken um, an ethics framework that has been developed out of Ottawa, and there's been a, a couple of other ones around this and said, okay, what do we need to think about from that perspective? What do we need to think about from a human rights perspective as we go through it? And those are just touching the surface, quite frankly, about mm -hmm. thinking through those issues around the social determinants of health. But we need to think about it in terms of all the control measures too. So all the things that we're doing are there for good reason, the physical distancing, the closing down business, you know, closing down the schools while well, we, we sought to understand this. But, you know, one of the challenges we have on a regular basis within public health is the fact that many of our decisions or, or the ways that we can address factors are inherently political. So mm -hmm. whether we're talking about the policy around transportation or we're talking about, about even quality daily physical activity in schools, those end up being political policy decisions. And we need um, our politicians to turn their minds to that because they do have access to experts that go beyond healthcare, that go to economics, that go to all of those factors that we need to consider as we go forward. So it's, an, it's a sometimes frustrating because we all have our own perspectives mm -hmm. that we come from, but, um, but absolutely essential part of managing uh, situations such as this, that there, there's that balance between 
um, a health approach and a political approach to managing it. And as we both know, democracy can be a messy process. Very. Um, <laughs> we're, we're running down in time. I, I have two other things I want to put to you in the five minutes or so I have left with you. Um, uh, the first one is kind of a crystal ball because often out of tragedy, um, good things can happen, lessons can be learned, and it can inspire us to think differently about the places that we live in and how they operate and function and how they serve some people and perhaps not others. And I'm watching uh, an incredible canvas of innovation that's happening around the world as people are trying to come to grips with how are we going to function differently when we, as we start to think about the future and the long recovery period that's likely in store for us. And I just wonder how that is factoring into the thinking of you and your team as you kind of think forward. Yeah, as, as human beings, we like to think about going back to what we had that was, mm -hmm. you know, comforting and secure. And we think of it all that way, but everything evolves over time. And these sorts of times are actually a period during which you can evolve things the fastest. And so we look at some of the things that have been done within healthcare, some of the things you and I have talked about around the table with our health partners about, wouldn't it be great if we could get to virtual care? Oh, look, <laughs> look at the benefits that have come out of this in terms of virtual care. Um, look at the collaboration that continues to go on. And uh, Tammy Packer, you know, one of our family mm -hmm. practice uh, colleagues and leaders, I, I won't forget the day that she said, you know, we need to keep in mind what it is we want to do in the long term, even though we're focused on this emergency, and think about what we're doing today that can help us to get to where we want to be. And, you know, great reminder to all of us. And so that, that kind of innovation, the ways that we work, mm -hmm. you know, there are truly, there are things where, um, you know, in the, in the congregate setting piece where, you know, long-term care homes, retirement homes where, you know, have we been placing enough investment into those those places and all that they need to do to support others? And how can we work together better as partners, but in mm -hmm. the community as well? You know, mm -hmm. what do we want in terms of our experience from, from a healthcare perspective, but also what does it mean for business? We're going to have a new normal. We're not going to mm -hmm. go back to the to where we were at, at least for some point in time. And by then, hopefully we'll have changed the world and our practices enough that we'll be very comfy with something new and even better than where we were at. Yeah. And so- not, not to mention, what does it mean for public transit, for public spaces, exactly. for the way in which our streets function, all those things that are ultimately connected to our health and our well being. And I suspect we're gonna see very different outcomes and futures here. Well, and we've been, you know, commenting often when I'm out and about with family and friends about how many people are out and physically active and walking Absolutely. because it's helping them with their mental health and it's helping them to do something. And you don't want to lose any of those really good gains. And we talk about that a lot. You know, we've made a lot of gains in terms of, of fighting this virus, but we've also made a lot of gains on other fronts too. And how can we continue with that ingenuity, that innovation, that Hamilton way that will take us to an even better place? Indeed. In the two minutes left, I want to ask you a personal question because um, all of us come to the roles that we're in with certain expectations and, and we have to function as professionals and leaders, but we're also human beings and we're dealing with the safety and well-being of our family, of our people who are our immediate staff team. We're thinking about all the other dimensions of managing our stress and I just wonder you are very much in the hot seat and have been what for going on at least a couple of months. What's it been like as, as an individual to live through this as a medical officer of health? And what are the dimensions that you've had to, to grapple with in, in your own life? Oh, those that, you know, somebody said to me a couple of months ago that this is like the public health Super Bowl. <laughs> 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 in many ways, they're absolutely right. You know, this is the the top of our game. We all need to be there. And yeah, I'm fortunate to work with an incredible bunch of colleagues. We've had a whole bunch of people come back to work um, from retirement. Debbie Sheehan, Doug Sider. I'm going to forget Doug. some of them. So, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, with the greatest apologies to those I, for, I haven't named, yeah. named, but it's just been fantastic in terms of bringing the group back together. And you know, you, you really have to rely every day on the people that you work with, but no more so than now. And I'm just so grateful for all of them. And, but there's all sorts of decisions to make. I happen to have a, a higher risk uh, family member. And so, 
you know, for me, it's better to work from home as much as I'd love to go into the office in many ways and see my colleagues. Mm -hmm. I miss them terribly, but I spend more time working at home than, uh, than some of my colleagues do. And so sometimes you feel guilty about that. Um, you know, those sorts of things that the number of hours that we put in is incredible. My colleagues and I, Mm -hmm. Um, all are working far longer hours than we, we usually would. The business hours, um, you know, are longer. And so people working weekends that don't normally are working nights that don't normally, that's just not part of public health. Yeah. But, um, and the fact that it continues on, you know, there's, there isn't a lot of reprieve from it. And, um, you know, with, uh, whether it's, um, you know, weekends, evenings, what it is, it's very hard to get a break from it. And that's probably the part I find the hardest. I need that downtime. I'm a person who likes, has lots of other interests and people to spend time with as many mm -hmm. are. And, uh, and I need that reprieve. And sometimes it's hard to find that. That's probably the hardest, as I said. Yep. Elizabeth, um, Dr. Richardson, I, I really appreciate your time, your leadership, what you've done for this community. And I value you as a colleague and a friend. Thank you for taking the time. Good luck, Godspeed, and uh, take care of yourself. Appreciate uh, you being with me. Thank you so much, Terry. All righty. I'm Terry Cook. You've been watching Hamilton's Vital Signs with Dr. Elizabeth Richardson, our Medical Officer of Health in Hamilton. As always, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Be safe, and we will see you next month. Take care.